In our last episode, we took a look at a very easy-to-use baseline audit script to allow us to identify and enumerate all of the services running on our systems within our domain and detect any changes that were occurring. In this next episode, we're going to continue on with that theme of detecting zero-day threats, advanced persistent threats, and other kinds of uh, zero-day malware for which there may be no virus signatures or antivirus signatures available. In today's episode, we're going to take a look particularly at something that I've found in the incidents where I've handled things that might be termed as advanced persistent threats. And one of the common criteria that I've found for something that I would classify as an advanced persistent threat is that in many of those cases when there have been disk traces left behind, I find that the attackers have left RAR files on the system. Now, why RAR files? Well, the reason that they seem to be using RAR for this is not just because it's a good compression tool, but because when you put things into a RAR file and protect it with a password, it is actually going to encrypt it using AES. Now, can't we encrypt files using other things like zip? Of course you can, but breaking a zip archive password is actually a relatively trivial task, whereas breaking a RAR file password can take many days or even months because the techniques for attacking it are involving AES which is a somewhat slower algorithm requiring gr much greater computing resources. So for that reason it's my belief that the APT or people who we would classify as APT attackers have chosen to use RAR with passwords making it that more more difficult for a defender who actually uh, recovers a compromised machine and realizes that the machine is infected to actually determine what was a part of the original rootkit. Well, how can we use something like that to our advantage, though? Well, for this episode, and continuing in the theme of scripting, we have a very, very basic script here, though I know when you look at it, it does not look basic. This script, as always, will be posted in its source code into the show notes for this particular episode on the sans.org site. So if you'd like a copy of it, you don't need to try to key it in from here. You could simply copy and paste it right off the website. Let's just take a look at what this script does. First of all, this particular script is written using Visual Basic. This VB script is going to allow us to go and compare or look at all of the file systems for any system in our domain that we'd like to query. So what if I'd like to know whether or not there are, how about RAR files? Exactly what I said that we're finding people with APT infections have on their systems. Now, of course, you can have RAR files for other reasons, but it's not that typical to find that users have archives on their system. And even if they do, they would tend to be in a few limited locations. If we found a RAR file popping up in the root of the C drive or in the Windows System32 directory, that would be very interesting for us as a defender. So here's what we're doing. This line right here, this is one of the most important pieces of this whole thing. What we're doing here is setting up a connection to a system that allows us to query the CIMV2 archive. The CIMV2 is going to be a repository or a uh, a database essentially that allows us to query the names of all of the files that are on our system and more than that too but that's how we're going to be using it in this particular episode and once we've done that notice that on our next line here what I'm doing is creating a variable called files and it's actually going to end up being an array what files is going to contain well it's going to do a WMI service query using select star from sim data file where drive equals C and extension equals RAR. Now, if you've ever done any work with databases, this particular line may look very familiar. This looks just like SQL. And in fact, this essentially is SQL. So this is really being treated as a database, the schema for which you can find documented publicly by Microsoft. And what I'm doing is telling it to go through that database from the SIM data file table and find all of the files that are on the C drive and whose file extension is RAR. Now, why am I including the C drive? We could have multiple drives on this system. 
And in fact, if you're working in an environment where you have multiple local drives, I would encourage you to modify that line to include those additional, those additional drives. So for instance, we may have where, and perhaps in some parentheses, we'll have drive equals C or drive e equals D, just as an example. But I I'm, I'm need to include that drive option. Now, why do I need that? Because if you don't include that, it will actually search all drives. Now, when you first hear that, you may say, well, that sounds like exactly what I want. I want it to search all drives. But by all drives, I also include all mounted shares. So that means that if your users have mapped out to their G drive, let's say, the, loc the file share from the domain, then when you run this against someone's machine, or if you ran it against everyone's machine, you're going to scan that domain share every single time. So instead, let's limit this just to local drives, and we can scan that domain, that domain share separately. All right, well, let's see what it actually does, though. You can spend some more time with the script one-on-one. -on -one. Let me uh, save that out. Now, to run this, I'm actually going to invoke it by typing cscript, and then the name of the tool, findrar.vbs. Now, this does require that we give it a runtime, a, a um, command line argument. I need to tell it which machine to talk to. So I'm going to have it query win764. Off it goes. Right now, it's connecting a WMI connection back to this Windows 7 machine, and then just archiving or searching through the... the um, file system to see whether or not it can find any files named test.rar or, or .rar. And in fact, it does. It finds one here called test.rar. Now, that did take a little while to run, and usually it's a bit faster than that. Let me run it against a different machine within my domain. I have a machine here named vSphere. This is our uh, vSphere management server for our test domain. And again, off it goes. Now, while you may be looking and saying, wow, this is taking a long time, I want you to put this in some context because it actually is not taking that long when you consider that it's going to give us a listing based on all of the files found on that local system. So it does turn out to be pretty fast. The reason is that this SIM database actually maintains a, something of a, a, an internal database through WMI being able to really efficiently query the B tree that exists within the NTFS file system. So here very quickly we can find for that remote machine, vSphere, here are all of the things that are available. In fact, I've got a copy of this go.bat script that we used in our last episode for doing our check services. Let me make a quick copy of that. I'll call it gorar.bat and I'm going to open that up. And what I'm going to do is change this query so that it's not going to check services. Instead what I'd like it to do is how about C script and then my find rar dot vbs and I'll have it run using the machine name that we recovered from here. So let me try go rar dot bat. Off it goes. And it will now be doing is doing this find rar against every machine listed in my domain. Now we could extend this even more. We could say, taking some of the logic out of our check services, we could do baselining so that I have a list of all of the RAR files that should exist in my domain and then monitor those for change. That's not a bad idea. In fact, I would probably do that a little differently. Rather than modifying or monitoring for RAR files, what I would prefer to monitor for are executable files, and then periodically simply scan my domain and identify whether or not there are new executables. Now, will you find new executables? I would not be surprised. In a domain of any size, there will be new executables. However, when you're finding new executables in your program files directory or your, anywhere in your Windows installation directory, that becomes very interesting unless there has been proper change management documentation. So it gives us a very useful uh, baseline because if there were malware, well, we're going to find either a new executable or a new DLL or maybe some change to an existing file. 
Of course, that check services comes into play here as well. But this tool could also be useful because if I needed to maintain or if I had a, a signature to look for, perhaps for some zero day threat, and I become aware that when this threat gets on your system, it creates a file that looks like this. I could now very easily query out through my whole domain and see whether or not that particular file exists on any of my systems. So this is quite a powerful technique and one of the many techniques that's possible for detecting things that are zero day or APT like. Now, there are other things we can do as well, and probably in our next episode we'll take a look at a piece of software called DNS Spoof that's going to allow us to do some, uh, some well, some detection of other malware-like signs, in addition to going back to our previous episode dealing with WPAD and leveraging that same kind of technique against any operating system, not just Windows.